Thank you, Flo, for being with us today. I appreciate you taking time. And I'd like to start by just asking you a few questions. The first one is, what events or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? There were a number of factors, but I do feel sort of like I've been on the path to do this work <laughs> since my childhood. <clears throat> my parents uh, instilled in me a, a love of nature and a, a love of travel and other cultures. We would go to the Bronx Zoo. Um, we'd attend lectures that were put on by the New York Zoological Society and would do a lot of hiking. And I grew up with a real love of the natural world and appreciation for it. In later years, was awakened a little bit by some of the messaging that they had at the Bronx Zoo and, and other places about conservation, that you know, these animals come from habitats that are being lost and that we're going to lose the wildlife if we destroy all of their habitats. And those things all sort of really were very formative for me, as well as traveling with my parents, uh, mostly in the U.S. and Europe, but also a little bit to the Caribbean and really enjoying the cultures that we got to know, again, particularly tropical countries. Uh, I think all of that sort of led me into wanting to study environmental conservation in college, study international affairs in college, and, and do more than just study. Sometimes I worried that I'd flunk out because I was spending more time on activism than on studies. I was involved in college in, in the Progressive Student Network, the Committee on Central America, because the peace movement was very focused on Central America at the time, because it was when the U.S. was uh, supporting death squads in El Salvador and the Contra War in Nicaragua. And that was a real awakening for me. I, I grew up with parents who you know, sort of came of age during World War II and told me um, that the U.S. was a benevolent force everywhere in the world. And, and they really believed that and you know, that they had some reasons to, to believe it. But I became aware that that was not 100 percent of the story with what I saw was happening in Central America. Apartheid was coming to an end then. So that, that was an, another inspirational story for me, I think. I mean, the fact that Nelson Mandela came out of prison and went on to become the president and did so with, with such grace and insight and, and in such a peaceful way when it, it could have gone uh, so badly. So these are some of the things that were happening in college that I think influenced me. I spent quite a bit of time in college doing awareness raising and being involved with protests, civil disobedience, guerrilla theater, all that sort of thing. Coming out of college, I really wanted to move more into hands-on work, creating the positive alternatives to, to the negatives that I had been protesting up till that point. But personally, as I got older, I felt more drawn to creating the, the change that, that I wanted to see in the world. And that led me into the Peace Corps. A little bit ironic after uh, protesting <laughs> the U.S. government's involvement in Central America for four years, I then became part of the U.S. government's involvement in, in Central America. But I, I ended up making that choice because Peace Corps was the only option I found that really offered very good support for somebody who wanted to volunteer for an extended period of time in Central America. And it ended up being a really great experience for me, would not have traded it for the world. And it was what really led me directly into my work, because I, I saw while living in rural Panama, things I had studied in college about tropical deforestation, how farmers were burning more of the forest every year to grow their crops, but not growing enough to really feed themselves well or, or make uh, much income at all. So I saw that they could really benefit from more sustainable farming practices, as well as the potential to save what was left of tropical forests, something else that I had learned a lot about in college. At, at that time, we were losing tropical forests at the rate of about one acre a second. And sadly, I think we still are. We lost more than half of them. But I, I saw this opportunity as a Peace Corps volunteer to offer farmers a way to, to not need to clear more forest in order to feed their families. Certainly that's not the only threat to the forest, but it is a significant one. And so that led me in, into my work with Sustainable Harvest International. And I think you know, Peace Corps is, is right on in, in having a, a two-year commitment from volunteers. Some people don't make it that long, but the expectation is that you will live and work in your community for two years. And I think it really takes that long to get to know the 
language and the culture and the environment and, and everything. And I feel like you spend the better part of a year just getting up to speed. And then you have a year of, of really actually functioning at <laughs> some sort of reasonable level um, right. enough to uh, contribute and to learn so much and grow so much. I think that that's really what Peace Corps offers is the opportunity for Americans to to learn and grow and to connect with people in other countries and other cultures and forge a, a much stronger person-to-person -person relationship that mm -hmm. I hope then informs the way the Americans who volunteer live and the perception that people in other countries have of what our country is all about, that it, it's not all about our, our foreign policy and our, our politics and other things that might be in the news. What continues to motivate you, to guide you, give you courage? Certainly an inspiration for me for most of my career has been the farmers that work with Sustainable Harvest International, going to their farms, seeing how little they have materially speaking, and particularly when they start with our program, how, how, how much happier I think they often are than people in our country, in our culture, much happier. And I think it's because they have things that we don't have so much like strong family ties, strong community ties. D despite the degradation that has happened to the natural environment, there is still, at least in the rural areas where I work, a much more closeness to the, to the natural world than I, th I think we have in for most of our population in this country and, and in many other countries. Seeing that with a little bit of assistance, they can make a good life for themselves in those rural communities. The tremendous amount of work they're willing to put in, the faith they're willing to put in working with our organization to turn things around for their families, but also for the global environment. So that the work that they're doing is having a really significant impact on uh, stopping biodiversity loss and, and stopping climate change and, and other environmental issues. Visiting the farms and seeing the tremendous beauty and abundance that can come out of want and, and degradation, that's a never-ending <laughs> source of inspiration for me, as well as young people everywhere, seeing they really are thinking about the world in terms of, of more than short-term material gain, that they're thinking beyond that. And so I find a lot of hope in that. I'm also struck by that an inspiration for you early on was the Bronx Zoo, which is in the middle of a big city, but that it somehow connected you to nature. Right. Yeah. And I know that some people don't like the idea of zoos. I certainly understand the sentiments behind that. And, and I certainly hate to see animals in cages or in, you know, not enjoying their lives. But if, if they can be in a situation in a zoo where they can have some sort of decent quality of life, which can be hard to judge, I suppose, what that means. And if that allows people like me growing in the suburbs of New York City to really uh, have my eyes opened to the fact that humans are not the only species on the planet, that there's this incredible diversity of amazing animals out there and, and can open my eyes to the importance of preserving the habitat for, for those many species, then, then I think it's, it's worth maybe a little bit of sacrifice of some animals not living in totally natural environment if it preserves the, the habitat of their cousins in the wild. What advice do you have for youth activists or for young people? My advice is to start out by really thinking about your, your own life and your own lifestyle and how that um, has impacts uh, on the issues that you care about. I think that often people feel like either they need to do you know, something really big to make a difference in the world. Really, it, it's things like the food that we buy. Where does it come from? How, how is it grown? Where are clothes made? Who, who makes them? What are they made from? And how are those <laughs> materials pr produced? It's all of those little day-to-day -day questions that I think add up so much to creating the, the kind of world that we want. I think it's wonderful to be open to other opportunities to plug in to efforts to make our world a better place. Or if somebody sees that there's a niche where that's not being filled and want to jump in and, and try to start something, I'd you know, certainly say to not be afraid of failing, that whether <laughs> you try it <laughs> or not, the need is there. And if you succeed, that's wonderful. If you don't succeed, it's okay. I, I think that often in our culture, people are a little too worried about failing at things. But if something 
is worth doing, then it, it's it's worth doing what, whatever the outcome. And it'll probably take a different path than what you expect. Certainly in starting Sustainable Harvest, I took a strange route with questionable choices and decisions <laughs> along the way, but ultimately it all gave me the experience and the knowledge that I needed to eventually succeed in, in the work that I wanted to do. Thanks a lot, Flo. Thanks.